Hey, welcome in everybody to Living the Word with Chris and John. Today we've got a special guest with us that we're going to introduce you to in just a minute, Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. He's got one of our favorite podcasts that John and I both listen to every single week. So it's an honor to have him with us today on our podcast. Um, John's actually going to be gone. Um, he's uh, going on a trip, and uh, so we'll miss him. And while, while he's gone, we've got several guests that we're going to have. And so today I'm going to be uh, talking about what we really believe as charismatics. And people, some people call us charismatics or Pentecostals or word of faith. There's a lot of different words they use for us, and they don't all fit. But we're going to talk about some of the things people have said about what we believe, and we don't actually believe those things. Um, and we're going to get down to the bottom of what we really believe as people that believe in the gifts of the Spirit, as people that believe in being filled with the Spirit. What is it that we actually believe about some of the things people have been falsely saying about us for a long time? We're going to learn about that and much more today on Living the Word with Chris and John. Before we get started on today's discussion, I want to encourage you to subscribe and hit the bell button so that you are notified every week when we publish new content. And if you have a question or a topic that you'd like us to talk about, please leave a comment below. All right. All right. We're going to get right into this thing. Here we go. Well, uh, I want to welcome everybody in, and especially I want to welcome my guest, Rod Saunders from Jew and Greek. Rod um, has uh, been doing Jew and Greek for quite some time and really um, is kind of an apologetics um, of charismatic word of faith um, um, movements. And he's got so many videos that helped me a lot. Really, I went back and watched the, one of my favorite, probably my favorite, is uh, talks about the roots of the word of faith. And uh, so before we get into some of our topic of what we're going to be talking about today, Brother Rob, why don't you talk to us a little bit about what Jew and Greek is and what you stand for and why it is that you're so passionate about this podcast that you do. Okay, well, first of all, uh, thanks for inviting me. It's good to be here with you guys. Um, I uh, started my blog and YouTube channel about six years ago because I didn't see anybody representing the viewpoint uh, that I hold to, the theological views that I hold to, being word of faith and charismatic and, uh, and even Pentecostal. Um, it's, this all started for me back in 1994, 93, 94, somewhere around there. Um, I was going to a church out in Florida, a charismatic church, and Hank Hanegraaff's book, Christianity in Crisis, had just come out. And uh, he was on the Bible Answer Man radio broadcast, and people, he, was, he had a huge audience. And so a lot of people were asking questions about the Word of Faith movement based on the things that he was saying. So people came up to my church and said, uh, hey, you went to Kenneth Hagin School. What do you have to say about what Hanegraaff is saying? So I said, well, I don't know. Let me read his book and find out what he's saying, and I'll get back to you. So I bought his book, and I went through it, and it was full of these what we call uh, logical fallacies, straw man mm -hmm. arguments, ad hominem attacks, and things <laughs> like that. And uh, he had in his footnotes other books that he was using as source material. One of them was John MacArthur's book, Charismatic Chaos. Mm -hmm. And another, another book was D.R. McConnell's book, A Different Gospel. So I got those books too and read through them and I saw through their arguments as well. So I thought, well, yeah, apparently nobody else knows how to respond to this stuff. So because of my background, I know how to respond. So I started writing out a response. It ended up becoming my book, uh, Defending the Faith, Word of Faith Apologetics. It's available on uh, Amazon Kindle in ebook format. Eventually, I'm going to have it to where you can get it in printout as well. But anyway, uh, so I, t I, I put this book together, shared it with some of the people at the church, but then I also took it down to Creation House Publishers. That's the book mm. publishing division of Strain Communications, which also does Charisma Magazine. And they were right there in Orlando where I lived. And they looked it over and they said, well, it's a good book, but there's no market for it because nobody knows who you are. So uh, <laughs> I, I didn't get the book published at that point, but I hung on to my rough draft. And then when Amazon Kindle came along, it said, I'm gonna publish that book that, ne that never got published. Mm. And uh, so I had to 
take it off of paper and I had to put it in the digital format and, <laughs> and upload it there. But that's, uh, I've been doing this a long time. That's the point mm -hmm. that I was trying to make. I didn't just start this a few years ago. I actually started yeah. it over 25 years ago. Wow. But okay. I'm, I'm just now getting a following on yeah. YouTube because there's not really a lot of voices out there like mine representing the charismatic view in the world of apologetics and theology. Right. Well, there's really not. And uh, that's why we were so excited when we found your channel. Uh, it's hard to find others like it where you just blow away so many of the lies. I mean, really, I can say with a surety now that many of the things that Justin Peters and John MacArthur say about the charismatic movement are false there. And it seems to be not just, just not just accidental lies, but on purpose lies that they've told about the charismatic church, because it's so easy or you make it seem very easy to uh, to destroy their 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 straw man arguments, you know. So um, that that gave me a great empowerment and, and made me excited uh, that, you know what, um, you know, I already believe that the Bible itself you know, defended what I had to say. But of course, people would say to you, uh, well, that's your interpretation of the Bible. So it was good to have some other things that I've learned from you to be able to say, well, you know what, um, uh, e you know, for instance, E.W. Kenyon, um, many, many, many times Justin Peters will say E.W. Kenyon is the real father of the Word of Faith movement, and he greatly impacted uh, Brother Hagin, and he came from the New Thought era, and, and, and he puts that together because it's possible that uh, that that the the gentleman that ran the New Thought uh, uh, that he that he uh, he went to one class with E. W. Kenyon at one point uh, way back in the day, and because of that, uh, somehow we've come to the conclusion that all word of faith is simply just a regurgitation of the New Thought error. And you were able to expose that and ex destroy that in in such an amazing way that encouraged me to know that there's more than just the fact of uh, we have a differences in a way we interpret scripture. There's real proof that um, what they're saying about the charismatic movement is absolutely false. Right. Yeah, you're entitled to your own opinion, but you're not entitled to your own facts. And yes. the facts, <laughs> exactly. once you pull out the, the, what really happened with E.W. Kenyon and Kenneth Hagin and New mm -hmm. Thought and everything, the facts do not support the, the view that Justin Peters is putting out there. As a matter of fact, there are other anti-word of faith apologists who disagree with Justin Peters and they say, okay. no, the uh, word of faith came from evangelicals in the late 19th century. It didn't come oh, wow. from New Thought. Okay. Yeah, Robert Bowman that. Jr., uh, uh, let's see, the Curtis Crenshaw, uh, let's see, Brian Onkin. These are people, some of them have actually written articles for, oh, wow. uh, the, for the Christian Research Institute, which Hanagraf runs, you know. <laughs> so you've got, you've got people with Hank Hanagraf's organization d refuting some of the things that Hank Hanagraf and Justin <laughs> Peters have said. Wow, that's awesome. Well, you know, uh, I wanted to, because you are a, you know, uh, I guess I'm going to call you a, an, an expert in this field because you spent a lot of your life studying this, this kind of stuff. So I'm going to bring up to you some things that have been said about our movement. Now, I want to talk about uh, my, my part in this movement, um, you know, what you want to call it, Word of Faith, Charismatic Pentecostal. All of those things probably apply because I believe a lot of Word of Faith doctrine I believe a lot of charismatic doctrine, a lot of Pentecostal doctrine, a lot of those things kind of flow mm -hmm. together. Um, I was at age five, um, uh, T.L. Osborne's grandson, uh, Tommy O'Dell, came to live in our house. Um, and he, he, in fact, we were one of the, I think the first uh, pl place he ever ministered as a evangelist. Um, we were at a meeting in Birmingham, Alabama, T.L. Osborne was there, and when he got done preaching, you got to understand this is 1982, so everybody wore suits, you know, three-piece suits, and they all had, uh, you know, nice-looking hair and so forth. And Tommy O'Dell, the grandson of T.L. Osborne, he had long hair, and, uh, and, and he wore blue jeans that had holes in them, and he just looked rough. So even when the great T.L. Osborne gets up there and says, hey, my grandson feels called to preach, if anybody would like to have him at, at, at their uh, church, 
come to the front after the service, and there were thousands of pastors there. Mm -hmm. And listen, only five pastors out of thousands took advantage of getting to uh, come to the front and get to know T.L. Osmond's grandson, shake T.L. Osmond's hand, and have him in our home. And I'm going to tell you something. Uh, Tommy O'Dell really changed our lives in many ways. He came to our house. This was our real, my real introduction. My dad's a Rama graduate, but uh, my real, real introduction to this whole movement was this. Um, Tommy O'Dell, the grandson of T.L. Osborne, came to my house, and he actually was given my bedroom, and I slept in the floor in another room. And every day I would hear him praying in other tongues. I didn't know he was praying in other tongues. He married Elizabeth, who is Dutch, actually. And, and, and so I thought he was speaking her language, but I noticed they would speak over each other a lot <laughs> because they were praying in tongues together for mm. eight hours a day. Then they would go out mm. at night and pray for the sick and cast out devils and do all those kinds of things. And so one day after a couple of weeks, I, was, uh, I asked them about what they were doing. And at five years of age, um, uh, uh, Tommy O'Dell was 18. My dad was about 24, 25. I was five. Um, you know, Tommy and Elizabeth sat down with me and explained with me uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then they laid hands on me. The Holy Spirit came upon me and I began to speak in tongues. And then I began to beg my dad to take me out with uh, and let me go evangelizing with uh, Tommy and with my dad on the streets. And I couldn't believe it, but dad allowed me to go. And, and, and at 11, 12 at night, I watched them cast the devil out of prostitutes and pimps. Mm. And I watched them pray for the sick. And I saw people get uh, delivered and set free and people weeping uh, as God touched their lives. And it had a big impact on my life, a huge impact on my life. And then um, after three weeks of doing ministry in our house, uh, we brought Tommy back home. And uh, at the time he was living with his grandparents. So we went home to T.L. Osborne's house who invited us in, spent the whole day with us, um, uh, uh, just was warm and welcoming him and Daisy. They gave us one of every one of their books and tapes and just loaded down our car with it. And then mm. T.L. Osborne laid hands on each one of us. And I want to tell you something. I came home from that, and for two years, for two years, I had dreams and visions after T.L. Osborne laid hands on me. For two years, Jesus would appear to me in dreams, and he would tell me Bible stories that I had not heard in church, that I didn't hear anywhere else. And I would get up and tell my parents, uh, you know, Jesus came to me in a dream last night and he told me such and such Bible story. And they would say, oh no, you heard that in, you know, you heard that in Sunday school. And I'd say, no, no, Jesus told me that dream last night. And this happened for two years. And the final time I had the dream uh, of Jesus was when he took me to a place um, where um, uh, he, he disappeared in the dream, but I was standing there and there was a cliff and I knew the cliff to be hell, that it, there was a drop off and the flames were coming. And I knew this cliff was hell. And there was a truck of Asian people. Just it, the only way to describe it, if, if there was a truck that was big enough to hold millions of people, uh, that's what it was. It was a truck of millions of Asians. And they were headed towards this cliff and they were about to drop off uh, into hell. And, um, uh, and I tried to get their attention. I was only five years old and I was jumping in front in the dream <coughs> saying, stop, stop, stop. There's danger ahead. And it stopped the truck just before it went off into hell. But then Satan appeared in my dream and he began to laugh and he began to uh, make fun of me. And then he kicked the truck off into hell. And then he said these words, there's nothing you can do about it. I woke up in a sweat and uh, crying and weeping. And I went to my parents' room um, and woke them up at two or three o'clock in the morning. And I told them, um, you're going to have to buy me a suit. Uh, because God has called me to be a preacher. And I knew at age five that all I wanted to do the rest of my life was tell people to get off the truck to hell. And at that time, I didn't know that that would mean eventually actually Asian people on the mission field because now I'm in Asia and I'm working among the unreached. I didn't know that was literally God showed me a vision of the fact I would be getting people off the truck to hell in Asia among Asian people. But my life was forever changed because of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was given dreams and visions that were biblical um, because they were all 
they were all uh, stories directly from the Bible. Uh, and then I had a vision about saving people from going to hell. So I wanted to say that first to let you know that I'm a lifelong Word of Faith kid. My dad was a Raymond graduate. I'm a lifelong Spirit-filled person. I believe in all the gifts of the Spirit, and I think it's a very important thing. So when I hear people tearing down what I hold to be so dear, it really hurts my heart. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the first thing I want to bring up that I've been told that people say about us say that we believe, uh, and I know we don't believe this, but many people say is about revelation knowledge. And so this is what they say, uh, mm -hmm. Brother Rod. They say that we elevate revelation knowledge. Uh, and revelation knowledge is just a term we use for when God uh, gives us knowledge that we would not have known by our natural resources, but by the Holy Spirit, He reveals things to us uh, and brings understanding and revelation to us that we only could know by the Holy Spirit. They say that revelation knowledge is, is, is not something that is for today. And many of these fundamentalists will say that, that charismatics elevate um, revelation mm. knowledge um, either above the Scripture um, or equal to the Scripture. And they say mm. that this, this, this revelation knowledge Either we get by the spirit or by an angel or by a vision or by a dream like I had, um, the dream that I have, that we elevate um, revelation knowledge to the same level as the Bible itself, or in some cases that we, uh, that we bring it above the Bible. So what, what would you say to those who would say charismatics put revelation knowledge that we get on the same level or even above the Bible? Well, first of all, I would say that there are different ways of understanding revelation knowledge. Okay. Uh, E.W. Kenyon was the one who coined the expression revelation knowledge. And if you read his book, Two Kinds of Knowledge, uh, he was just talking about the Bible. The hmm. Bible was given by revelation as opposed to sense knowledge, which is empiricism, the, the knowledge that you gain through the five physical senses. And mm -hmm. so that's the way that Kenyon used it. He wasn't talking, because Kenyon wasn't really a charismatic. He was a Baptist. Mm. Okay. And so he wasn't really into the gifts of the spirit. Uh, but when charismatics started using the expression revelation knowledge, they kind of blended together the concept that Kenyon had with the gifts of the spirit, the revelatory gifts, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, discerning of spirits. Okay. And uh, so revelation knowledge kind of changed definitions in the charismatic movement to meaning what the Holy Spirit reveals to you personally outside of Scripture. But in answer to your question, I don't know of anybody in the charismatic movement that is reputable that believes in an open canon of Scripture. Mm -hmm. We all believe that the canon is closed. God's not giving any more authoritative revelation like scripture anymore and that every revelation every vision that he gives every prophecy has to be judged by the word of god if it doesn't line up with the word of god then you don't receive it because the same holy spirit that gave us the bible is going to give us revelation that is consistent with the word of god right amen that's good um, another thing that they would say about us um, and uh, is an interpretation that we have about Scripture. And by the way, you know, charismatics, as, as you just said, we hold to the fact that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible Word of God. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that it, it has the highest, it's the highest of standards. And so what it teaches is what we believe. And if it, if it goes against something we really want to believe, um, if it goes against that, we've got to go with what the Word of God says above all else. Um, mm -hmm. But um, uh, another thing that people have said um, is one of the famous teaching that I, I have taught, my dad has taught, many of us has taught, uh, based on Philippians 2, that, we, uh, that Jesus emptied himself. And what we mean by mm -hmm. emptied himself is we believe that um, the scripture says that he, he, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but he emptied himself and became as a man um, and operated as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit. And the reason that's important to our doctrine is this. If Jesus did all the things he did, like healing blind eyes and, and raising the dead, if he did those things as God, then there's no hope that we could do those things. 
But mm -hmm. if he did those things as a man empowered by the Holy Spirit, then there is hope that we can do this, the things he did and greater things, as Jesus would say. Um, uh, in John 14, 12, that we could do the things he did and even greater things could we do. So, um, so we, we say that, that we understand that when he says he emptied himself, um, that he means that he operated, he chose to operate in this world as a man. But what we have been accused of, many, many of us have been accused of by fundamentalists, is that we teach that for a moment, um, Jesus was not God. Um, some people say that it was at the cross that he was not God. Uh, some people say that they that we teach that he was not that he walked around on earth in his ministry not as God but only as man. Um, what would you say to people that 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 say that uh, about what charismatics believe about Jesus emptying himself of deity? Well, again, I don't know any charismatic reputable charismatic there may be people on the lunatic fringe but i don't know of anybody <laughs> personally who teaches that jesus was ever anything other than god in the flesh in essence but jesus this is what we call the hypostatic union the the union okay. of humanity and deity in jesus he had two uh natures if you want to put it that way and this is where you get into a lot of hair splitting on on uh semantics on how you mm -hmm. word it but uh, jesus was human and he was divine but when he walked yes. on the earth he did not do miracles by his inherent deity he did mm. miracles by the power of the holy spirit he was the son of god he was god in the flesh for 30 years before right. he ever did a miracle he never did a miracle in the whole, until the holy spirit descended on him at the baptism of john and then after his temptation he went into the synagogue and he read from the scriptures, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach, to proclaim the gospel to the poor and so forth. So, and then he handed the scroll back and he said, this day is this uh, scripture fulfilled in your hearing. Yes. So, so what he was proclaiming is that I now have this anointing. The spirit of the Lord has now anointed me to do this. Mm. So uh, even though he was God in the flesh for 30 years, he didn't start doing miracles until he was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Wow. Now, what you're, what you're referring to is the self-emptying is known as the doctrine of kenosis. Okay. And it's interesting, if you study the doctrine of kenosis, it goes back to the 19th century. And originally, the doctrine was a, a defense of the deity of Jesus. Because okay. after the Enlightenment, a lot of people were saying, Jesus couldn't have been God because he had to eat, he had to sleep. Uh, and he died. Uh, and mm. so how could you say that he's God if he, if he had to eat and sleep and he had to do, <laughs> if he had human limitations, how could you say that mm. he is God? And so theologians, you know, searched the scriptures and they said, well, you know, we've got to give an answer for this. And a man named mm -hmm. Gottfried Tomasius, a German theologian named Gottfried Tomasius, is the one who said, I think uh, Philippians 2, 7 is your explanation. This is how he could be divine and still have human limitations wow. because he willingly gave up his divine capacities or set it aside. He always had access to it, but mm. he willingly set aside on the Mount of Transfiguration. You remember uh, Jesus began to show his glory that wow. was veiled throughout his earth walk. But uh, that's, what they're, that's what we're referring to. When we talk about uh, the, the self-emptying, we're actually in theological terminology. It's called the, the doctrine of kenosis. And okay. it, was, it was created to defend the deity of Jesus <laughs> from infidels. Funny? And now people <laughs> attack you saying you're denying the deity of Jesus when you hold to the doctrine of kenosis. It's very ironic because as long as, the, as long as the cessationists we're talking about the doctrine of kenosis. It was okay, but when charismatic started using it, all of a sudden it's heresy. All right. Well, that was uh, very funny to hear that the very doctrine that they used <laughs> to prove the deity of Christ is what now fundamentalists uh, will use to try to uh, uh, to try to come against us who believe that Jesus never stopped being God, but he did empty himself and chose mm -hmm. not to use his deity when he was on earth. And I'm so glad that that's the case. You know, uh, many people, um, you know, uh, uh, 
I was I had a group of men that came to me because for a short while um, we were blessed with a building when I was pastoring and, and it was a, a Baptist organization that gave us a building, which was amazing. But they said the only uh, catch to this is you have to be Baptist for one year. And then after the one year, you can, this is this was 10 acres of land plus a building and everything that went with it. And I was like, well, shoot, if, if John, if it's good enough for John, it's good enough to be I, for me. I'll be a Baptist, you know, for a free building and all those things. <laughs> but for real, they said, uh, they said, look, all we ask is that, that you uh, you are ordained Baptist if you pass the, uh, the uh, uh, being challenged on what you believe. Um, and then um, at the end of one year, it's up to you. You can decide if you want to stay Baptist or not. No strings attached. We're giving it to you. And we were so appreciative. They gave it to us. And I was grilled on my theology for three hours. Um, and it was great. I love that kind of stuff. And, uh, and this was one of the things they challenged me on. Um, mm. And uh, by the way, I was still ordained by the Southern Baptist. Uh, they knew that I spoke in tongues. Um, and they challenged me concerning Jesus doing miracles. And that they, of course, believed in um, cessationism. Uh, they believed that that after the, uh, uh, the 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 final writing apostle, you know, passed away, that uh, miracles were done away with. And uh, I may not have that exactly right, but I'm pretty close to what they believe. And so they they knew that we believe miracles still happen. And of course, we've seen hundreds and hundreds of miracles, so we know that they happen. But um, one of the hangups they had was this, and they said to me straight up. They said, um, Jesus did miracles to prove that he was the son of God. But then I opened up some scriptures to them and I showed them how many times out of all the times that Jesus did miracles. And it's an astounding amount, by the way. It says um, um, that he had mercy, excuse me, he had compassion, compassion on them and he healed the people. I'm talking mm -hmm. over and over <clears throat> and over uh, many a time. Now, there were other times, for instance, the book of John, it says these were written that you might believe that Jesus is the son of God. So there mm -hmm. were miracles that specifically were so that we would believe that he is the son of God. But there were other miracles where Jesus healed simply because he had compassion. So this right. is what I said to the guys. I said, if Jesus healed because he had compassion. And if we believe that Jesus has raised from the dead and he is currently alive, do we believe that he still has compassion today? And if he still has compassion today, doesn't that mean that Jesus still wants to heal and touch today? And you know, it really opened those guys' hearts. And uh, one of them said, well, you know, Brother Chris, you're right. And uh, the only difference is we believe that he does. He, we believe that, that God does sovereignly heal people because he does have compassion. And, and they said, we just don't believe like you that he always wants to heal. But they say, you, you make a great point. And so so it did have an impact on their mm -hmm. life. Um, but but back to some of these things I wanted to bring up to you, because I, I do think that you're an expert in these in this field. I'm, I'm glad that, that you've done so much study on this. And by the way, this is a plug. Make sure that you go and subscribe to Jew and Greek. Make sure you look up Rod Saunders on Jew and Greek. Subscribe, like, click the bell on that um, because there's so much rich stuff there. You can look about the history of the Word of Faith, the history of Charismatics, and you can look at a lot of videos. One of my favorite, again, is, I mean, and it'll be your favorite too. If you watch the, the if you are full of the Holy Spirit, and you watch the movie American Gospel, you were you had to have been offended. You had to have been offended mm -hmm. um, because that book absolutely points the finger at charismatics and calls and, and makes them look like the devil and makes it look like we preach another gospel. Um, and uh, I was really offended by the movie. And uh, at first it actually drew me in. At first I thought, oh, this is going to be good. This is about preaching the true gospel and, you know, some of these things. And pretty soon I said, oh, they, there's another agenda here. And then later I found out that, that the majority, if not all, of those that were involved in the film uh, were actually Calvinist. And so it was actually very much, they had an agenda in making that film. So if you want to hear Rod destroy, <laughs> destroy that movie, uh, American Gospel, I mean, he breaks it down bit by bit and just tears down their false teaching against the charismatic church and the stuff that they did uh, uh, to poor uh, uh, brother uh, Todd um, uh, and others that they really made look bad. Um, you know, I think you'll enjoy what he has to say on that. Now, a couple of things we'll bring up. I want to bring up redemption. Uh, some claim that we believe that the cross 
um, was not enough to cleanse us of our sin, that Jesus further had to burn in hell, that he had to go to mm -hmm. hell and suffer in hell. And of course, uh, the, the Apostles' Creed itself says that Jesus descended, descended. into hell. And right. the scripture teaches that he went to the lower parts of the earth. So, you know, uh, not just what do Word of Faith and Charismatics believe in general, but, you know, how do you explain that scripture? Did Jesus have to, uh, uh, of course, they say it's heresy that we teach that he, um, and they say that we teach that Jesus suffered in hell. Of course, I don't teach that, and I don't believe that there was any redemptive work done in hell. I don't think that was the purpose of Jesus going to hell. But kind of explain what was the purpose of him going to hell. It wasn't redemption, so what was it, and what do you believe that Jesus went there for? Okay, well, first of all, there is a, uh, there's a confusion regarding the word hell. Uh, because okay. the, in the Bible, the, in the King James Bible, the word Hades sometimes is translated hell rather than okay. Hades. Hades wasn't just the, the you know, lake of fire or whatever, the, the, the hell part. Uh, Hades was the realm of the dead and included okay. paradise and hell. Okay. And uh, so the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man in Abraham's bosom, you know, uh, Abraham's mm -hmm. bosom is another way of saying paradise. And then the rich man okay. in hell called, uh, anyway. Uh, so you have to understand when the word is in, the, even in the Apostles' Creed, when it says Jesus descended into hell, that's right. based on a misunderstanding uh, of the word Hades. Now, uh, John Calvin, in his Institutes of the Christian Religion, John Calvin himself said, we need to leave that line in the Apostles' Creed because Jesus did descend into hell because bodily mm. punishment alone wouldn't suffice, that he had mm. to suffer the horrors of a condemned man and, and, and wow. at, close, at close quarters with the powers of hell. John uh, Calvin said that. John Calvin oh. said that. This is where this is where it all originated. Oh my goodness! And, 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 and wow. that's the fascinating thing about this is some of these people who are attacking <laughs> charismatics on this are Calvinists, and it all started with Calvin. And oh then uh, others in the 19th century who studied Calvin uh, began to also teach this: uh, Jesus finished paying for our sins in hell uh, doctrine. And then E.W. Mm. Kenyon picked it up and he wrote a book called uh, What Happened from the Cross to the Throne. And mm -hmm. then based on what he wrote, others in the charismatic and word of faith movement taught that version. I don't agree with mm. it. No. And many Me word neither. of faith people don't agree with uh, the, the view that uh, Kenyon and Kenneth Hagin and Kenneth Copeland and others have posited that uh, Jesus actually finished okay. paying the price for our redemption in hell. But here's okay. what I tell people. What we're talking about here is the process of atonement. Mm -hmm. we're, right, not right. Talking, we're not talking about the efficacy of the atonement. You okay. know, whether or not, I, that's the, the, the most ironic thing about this is that when Calvinists accuse us of heresy regarding the atonement, these Calvinists don't believe that the atonement is efficacious for the vast majority of humanity. He only died oh, for the right, elect. Right. He only the atoned limited for atonement. the elect. Right. And I, th mm -hmm. I think the efficacy of the atonement mm. is much more important than the process. That's you right. Know, what happened between the crucifixion and the resurrection is not yeah. nearly as, as relevant as did Jesus die for the sins of the whole world. Come on. That's, a much, Amen. that's a much more important issue in yes. my mind. And uh, so That's anyway, th this is what I call, I mean, the only creed that says anything about what happened between the crucifixion and the resurrection is the Apostles' Creed and the Athanasian mm. Creed that say Jesus okay. descended into hell, which is consistent mm. with the word of faith position on this. So right. it's, it's a secondary issue. It is not a fundamental issue. And right. there's room for disagreement on this. Uh, Kenneth, yeah. Hagin's, Kenneth Hagin's own mentor, Pop Goodwin, disagreed with him on this. Okay. So, you know, to me, yes, there are some people who hold to uh, a, a different view on this, but I don't consider it heretical. And some and, of the and, people- And also, it's not just charismatics, as you said, John Calvin said it. Right. So there's many that believe that besides just this group, you know. Right. The different people have different views on, on, you know, I mean, Kenyon took it way further than H.A. Ironside and uh, mm -hmm. others in the 19th century did. But again, it's, it's speculative and it's a secondary issue. 
Right. I don't well, think it's anything we know, should divide over. No, agreed. Uh, now, I think there is something that that is is a serious accusation <laughs> that's brought, which is um, that some of us teach. Um, and I wonder, do you know any um, charismatics, uh, reputable charismatics, as you call it, that teach that Jesus actually um, experienced spiritual death and had to be born again? Um, uh, you know, the scripture clearly says that Jesus became sin who knew no sin, that we would become the righteousness of God. And it clearly says that Jesus Christ uh, became a curse because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Um, so he, he became a curse. He became sin. And he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because God cannot mm -hmm. look upon sin. And so it, it appears that God turned his back upon his only son. But I think it's taken it too far then to say that means that he became lost and had to be born again. And right. we have been accused as charismatics as saying that that's part of our doctrine, that we believe Jesus himself was lost and had to be saved, born again. Um, that, uh, that, that's a pretty scary doctrine for anybody to teach. And I would hope there are no reputable charismatics who teach it. But do you know any that, that do teach such a, such a doctrine? I have never heard anybody teach that Jesus had a sin nature, that he ever sinned, okay. or that he ever needed redemption himself. What, okay. what has been taught is that during the process of atonement, there was separation that occurred between the Father and the Son when the sins right. of humanity were placed on Jesus. And as you said, he cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Billy Graham himself said that Jesus experienced spiritual death. Death wow. meaning separation from separation. the Father, not meaning mm. taking on a sin nature, but he okay. took on okay. our sin. And while right. our sin was on him, he was separated from the Father during the process of atonement. Mm. So was he born again? I did a video on this. Uh, was Jesus oh, okay. born again is the name of it. And it, okay. it goes into all of this. Uh, you, what happens here is you get into a, a bit of semantics, uh, mm -hmm. a, a problem with semantics is what do you mean by born again? If you mean saved, okay. if, you, if you mean had a sin nature and now he's got a new nature, no, yeah. Jesus wasn't right. born again in that sense. But Jesus was resurrected. In yeah, a glorified... and the Bible calls him the first one, the first born among many brethren. First uh, born the way um, among it. the dead. Acts 13, 33 says that yeah. uh, this day have I begotten thee in reference to mm. the resurrection. So mm. Jesus was born again in the sense that he uh, overcame death with a glorified right. body. And, and you, you mm. can just call it kind of a metamorphosis. I mean, the Apostle Paul talked right. about it's sown a natural body. It's raised uh, right. a, a, a glorious or supernatural body or spiritual body, mm -hmm. however he put that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, tadpoles become frogs right. and <laughs> caterpillars become butterflies. In that sense, Jesus went through a metamorphosis. He was born again right. in a glorified state. But right. was he born again in the sense of a sinner needing to be saved? No, he never had a no. sin nature. He never sinned. He never needed redemption himself. His separation Amen. was for us. Right. Well, you could not have said that better. And I'm going to make sure that we put in the in our uh, com uh, not just in the comments, but in the description of this video, we'll we'll make sure with your permission, we'll make sure and go ahead and put a link to that video um, that you said <clears throat> was Jesus born again. I think everybody needs to watch that. And actually, I'm excited to uh, when we finish here, <laughs> go uh, listen to it as we go home. So that, that's great. Um, well, the, the last uh, area I want to talk about, I want to spend a little more time on it. Um, um, we're going to take uh, about another 10 to, to 12 minutes together, and then we're going to pray. I'm going to pray for the people. Um, uh, but I wanted to uh, bring up an issue about, um, <clears throat> about worship and about um experiencing the presence of God. And I want to bring this up because this is what has been said about modern day worship, like Bethel and, um, and uh, Elevation Worship and other groups like that, Hill Songs and different ones. Um, much has been said about how um, they, they take this way too far and that they, um, they bring people into a mass hysteria. 
Um, and in just a second, I'm going to read a little bit of an article written uh, by a gentleman about mass hysteria and how he believes that charismatic have have you know taken it too far and have gotten into some mass hysteria. Now, I'm going to tell you that um, I, I agree that there have been times when charismatics have taken it too far. Um, there was someone, you know, I don't even like to say this, but uh, it doesn't. But just because one. Uh, person does something wrong, it doesn't mean you throw out the entire movement. Um, but you know, we had someone at our church that um, <clears throat> that uh, fell, um, and you know, they fell fell out because they felt the presence of the Lord. They, they weighed about 300 pounds, and there was another lady about 80 pounds laying on the ground, and the lady that was 300 pounds fell into the lady that was 80 pounds, and she went and screamed and made a horrible sound. And, uh, uh, and of course we had to pick her up and we took her to the hospital. She had three broken ribs and, uh, and, and then, uh, uh, and then another person was laying down and, and, a, a, an usher stepped on her hand and, and broke her finger. And, uh, so we had, uh, we said, you must, you must've been at a charismatic church. If you have to go to the hospital after the services <laughs> became kind of a joke there, but, uh, you know, but that's out of, out of, uh, you know, 30 years of my dad's church, there was two instances where something like that happened, where just human mm. error happened. And uh, people can sometimes, you know, fall in the flesh and things like that. Mm -hmm. And and that's what happened. And after that, we began to be um, a lot more careful about making sure that people weren't just falling down because they, you know, every time you feel a feeling, you have to fall. You know, it became the thing at that time, back especially in the 80s and 90s. It became a thing that if you feel the Holy Spirit, you have to fall down um, to show that you've you've got, we used to call it a courtesy drop, you know, that every right. single time somebody touches you and you feel the Holy Spirit, you have to fall down. Well, there is a real falling down because you feel the Holy Spirit's presence. But there also are some people that, that, that have fallen down a, a, out of mass hysteria uh, or out of, just, I'm sorry, not mass hysteria, but, but just out of uh, emotionalism and things like mm -hmm. that. And, and, and in some cases, people have gotten hurt. But, but anyway, towards the end of Brother Hagin's ministry, he began to do Holy Ghost meetings. And some of those Holy Ghost meetings um, got pretty wild. And uh, people were for hours would lay in the floor and laugh and uh, and and do different things and uh, and it and it kind of tainted his ministry in the eyes of a lot of people. I mean, sixty something years of teaching the Word of God, and you know, for the last few years of his ministry, he was just doing these Holy Ghost meetings. And a lot, I've been to, I went to a lot of them, and they were very powerful. Um, so I'm not going to throw them out just because there was some weird stuff that happened there. But this one gentleman um, that's a theologian. And he wrote this article and he, he talked about being a Baptist and, and, and his experience of being invited. And this is what he said. He said, I was a Southern Baptist all my life um, and I had a lot of good natured friends um, who used to call me the frozen chosen because I was a Southern Baptist and they were charismatics. And so they invited me to their church. And, and he said, um, it's a vast understatement when I say a charismatic experience was brand new for me. He said, on the first night, I heard numerous messages in tongues. I witnessed seemingly uncontrollable laughter. They called it Holy Ghost laughter, fainting spells, intense weeping and wailing, prophecy ranging from predictions of deliverance from headaches uh, and to cancer and forecasting of God's wrath on American cities. I watched a man and a woman run laps around the sanctuary. Um, a young man bounced up and down in convulsions um, as he grabbed hold, uh, just as if he had grabbed hold of an electric wire. Um, a woman in the pew behind me was doing jumping jacks while uh, arms wildly uh, going back and forth. At one point, an older woman asked if I would like to have hands laid on me to have my needs met. And despite significant neediness that I did have, I had to decline because I was very, very afraid. <laughs> he said, after a couple of these meetings with my friends um, who were continuationists, um, uh, even though I saw a true experience with God, I found this to be too much, even though I felt many of them were genuine. Well, this is what I wanted to say and then, and then just kind of take your your points on this. You know, I gave you a couple of examples out of thousands. I mean, there are thousands of great experiences where people had fallen in the floor because they were overcome by the spirit and were healed of cancer. Um, one lady is 89 years old now. Um, and she tells every year about how she was given a death sentence 
um, in my parents' ministry in 1980, had uh, breast cancer, both breasts. It had metastasized through her body. She was given no chance to live. And through God's healing power, she fell in the floor. Uh, she had never fallen down before. The Holy Spirit hit her. She fell on the floor. She was healed of cancer. And some 40 years later, she still testifies to that healing. Mm. There have been people who were in terrible depression, wanting to kill themselves. And after going to these Holy Ghost meetings and being overcome with laughter, um, they were healed of these deep, depressing uh, anxiety disorders and different things. There are, there, there's, there's, you know, the, the point, I would say 0.1%, you know, or, or 0.01% bad things happen for all the many, many wonderful experiences that happen to people. So I would say that there have been extremes, yes, but that doesn't mean that all of these um, experiences were just mass hysteria. Um, I think many of these experiences were genuine moves <clears throat> of the Holy Spirit where people's lives were changed for ever. And so I do think there is mass hysteria. And I do think we have to be careful that we don't move into the flesh just because we want to experience something like that. We push so hard and we do it in the flesh. At the same time, I want the power of the Holy Spirit and I'm for that. And, and I will say this final thing about Brother Hagin's Holy Ghost meetings. Um, you know, every year somebody will post uh, on Facebook and they will show um, some of the craziest uh, Holy Ghost meetings where uh, there's one where a guy jumps. You might have seen the video where a pastor jumps up on the podium and jumps up and down and then dives into the baptistry and, and people are just running all over the place and, and they show that. But here's the thing that really bothers me about that is those videos were never intended for the public. Um, these were private meetings where everyone that was there was a Rhema graduate or was uh, ordained through Rama, and they were there for a minister's conference. There were no unbelievers there. There were no untaught people there. All right, the Bible says if there's anyone there that's an unbeliever or anyone that's untaught, that you shouldn't speak in tongues as a group and you should do things decently and in order and all that kind of stuff. But at these meetings, I know they look crazy, but if you were there, and I was, I was there. If you were there, um, you know, there was some excesses, but here's the thing. If you were there, here's the facts. Um, it was meant for people who had full understanding, who, who were not unlearned, untaught, who were saved and filled with the Spirit and who needed a release and needed to be touched and needed joy. And for them, it was a delivering, wonderful experience 99.9999% of the time. That's what it's for. But what's happened is they've taken what was meant to be an intimate moment with God's people at a camp meeting for God's people and then they put it on video for unbelievers and untaught and fundamentalists to see. It was never intended for that. And so I don't believe that uh, Brother Hagin was necessarily out of order in those meetings. It wasn't meant for the unbelievers to ever see. And it's sad that someone has taken those videos and put them out for the public and made fun of charismatics, calling it charismania and so forth. Um, but talk a little bit about extremes versus the real and your thoughts about those things that I'm talking about right now. It's very personal to me. Well, the, the, here, that's the problem with this is that there is so much extremism and, and fleshly uh, activity. The same thing happened in Azusa, in the Azusa revival. Uh, they had a genuine outpouring of the Holy Spirit and genuine manifestations but then people mm. thought, well, that's the way it's supposed to be done. And then they started mm. trying to duplicate that in the flesh. And I think that's what has happened here. Uh, I was actually living in Orlando, Florida, back in the early 90s when Rodney Howard Brown started conducting his meetings there at the Carpenter's okay. Home Church in Lakeland. And that's really where his ministry took off was while he was holding those meetings there. I never went to any of those meetings. And... Um, I, I knew people who had met Rodney Howard Brown, and uh, you know we, we got to talking about it and everything. And uh, you know some people thought that this was really God, and some people didn't know what to think. But I mm -hmm. never spoke against it, and here's why: when I was going mm -hmm. to an Assembly of God church back in the 1970s, now you got to understand, I grew up Baptist. Okay? okay, that was a big step for me. Like the friend you were talking about a while ago, <laughs> the, when I started at that Assembly of God church, I like what in the world is going on here? You know, this is not like my Baptist church. 
Right. But I eventually, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, you know, and I became a Pentecostal. I went to an Assembly mm -hmm. of God church for six years. And my Assembly of God Sunday school teacher told us one time about a meeting that she was in when she was young. Now, she was in her 50s okay. when she was telling the story. And so yeah. she's talking about 30, 40 years ago. So this was in the okay. 70s. So she's talking about the 40s or maybe the 30s. Mm. And she was in this meeting where the Holy Spirit came down and, and people just started staggering around like they were drunk and, mm. and laughing. And she said, we were drunk on the Holy Ghost. Now, she was not talking about a charismatic meeting in the 80s right. and 90s. She was talking yeah. about a Pentecostal church meeting back wow. in the 30s or 40s when she was young. Wow. I remember okay. her talking about being drunk on the Holy Spirit. That's so amazing. I had heard I had heard of that before. I'd never experienced it, but I'd heard of it from yeah. my Assembly of God Sunday school teacher. And okay. then when I started seeing these meetings, and then when Brother Hagen started having these meetings, I I never went to very I went to a few of them, but I never really got anything out of it. But I never spoke against mm -hmm. it because right. I knew from what my Sunday school teacher had told me that this mm. wasn't new, this wasn't different. The same things right. happened in the early days of Pentecost. They happened, yeah. I mean, they've, ha they've happened for over a hundred years, going back to Azusa. Mm. And so uh, what people need to know about Kenneth Hagin is that he was in the ministry for over 50 years before he started having these Holy Ghost meetings. And, right. and he resisted at first. The Lord told mm -hmm. him, if you don't have these Holy Ghost meetings, there's gonna be mm. a move of the spirit that's lost to this generation. Wow. And so wow. he started having the Holy Ghost meetings uh, in the last five to 10 years of his life. It, but that, yes. and some people think that's all he did. They think that was his whole right. ministry. No, oh, no. no. He had a, he had a long a teacher. history of teaching yeah. and, and prophetic ministry right. a, a, apart from these Holy Ghost meetings. But once he started doing this, unfortunately, a lot of people thought, well, that's what, that's what God is doing now. So they go yeah. back to their right. churches and they try to replicate what they've exactly. seen here and there. And there are people to, to this day, over mm -hmm. 20 years later, that still want to have those Kenneth Hagin <laughs> Holy Ghost meetings That's in true. their churches all across the country. And, yes. and there's, there's no life to it. I've seen it. You know, I know it's, it's, they're right. just trying to make it happen. Right. Now, well, you don't, you, know, you don't make it happen. You, you have no. to be led by the Spirit in these things. So, yeah, right. I would say... There are, uh, there's a lot of extremism. There's a lot of people getting into the flesh. There's a lot of people trying to conjure up some kind of a move of the spirit through their music, right. like you said. Yeah. Uh, right. is, is it mass hysteria? It could be, but I think most of the time it's just the flesh. Amen. Well, my dad always says like this. He says, I would rather have wildfire than no fire. In other mm -hmm. words, it's easier to take people that are on fire for God and a little excited and kind of squell that a little bit and say, okay, now let's bring it back to the center. Then it mm -hmm. is to take something dead and bring it to life. It's almost impossible to do that. And so uh, I right. agree with him on that very much. And I want to thank you for being with us on Living the Word. It was a oh, huge honor for me. Uh, it meant a lot to me and you brought a lot of wisdom and I hope we do this again very soon. Um, and guys, check out, check out as soon as you can, uh, Jew and Greek. Uh, with Rod Saunders, and I'll make sure and put some links up on our website. We're so glad you guys joined us, and we'll see you very soon again on Living the Word with Chris and John. God bless. <laughs>